So I mentioned on Slack that um, I was going to try to get this ported over to the new format. I ran out of time and I was about to start like trying to push myself to find a way to get it done. And I was like, no, I already have one. I'll just show that as the format. And then still over hopefully the next few days, I'll try to get it transferred over. And I'll talk a little bit about why, even though Cordo and R Markdown are compatible, why it's not just a flip a switch and then, um, you know, we're moved over. All right. So, but what we're going to focus on today this is the final chapter of uh, R for Data Science. This is the Data Science Learning Community Cohort 10. And uh, so today we're going to hopefully be able to uh, render, <laughs> render Cordo documents to different formats. Um, we're going to be able to set output options for Cordo documents in different formats. We're going to render documents in various formats from those Cordo documents, render presentations, uh, create interactive web pages with Cordo, um, group Cordo documents together into websites and books. We're going to talk about that fairly briefly, but we'll actually see a little bit more about that uh, in the the other setup. And then we'll um, figure or we'll learn how to find information about other Cordo, yeah, other Quarto formats. All right. Um, so to get started, like if you don't tell Cordo what format you want, it defaults to HTML. Uh, but you can give this YAML header with a format tag to give it these other formats that we're going to talk about. And then also optionally, um, oh, I should have put that here. Anyway, um, you can use Cordo render with, from the Cordo package to render your Cordo documents. And there you can give it an output format. And that output format can be a vector of different formats. Um, and the one that we're going to see later is you can also say all, which will form uh, output it in whatever formats are specified in the YAML header. All right. Um, so each format, there's a link here to all the different formats. We're going to talk about most of them throughout the chapter. Uh, but they have their own. Um, options that you can set. So under the, like under HTML, you can say, I want a table of contents and I want it to float. Um, some of these parameters can be uh, shared, like, or, you know, can be used by all formats. Like TOC apparently is a parameter that is available to all formats. And then some are specific to certain formats like code fold true, or I think this TOC float uh <clears throat> is an html specific um format setting and you know there are some that are obviously uh very specific to the format because it would be like um you know what css style sheet am i going to use and that might kind of apply in to some of the other formats but it's a html thing where there are other html specific settings um you know and you might tell it something about like there might be a a word specific uh argument that you would give to the docx format. Um, and there is where it says I'll put format equals all uh, can be used to render in all of these formats that we have set up. All right. And now we're going to do a few slides of just kind of running through all these formats that are available, um, just so you kind of have seen them before. Um, so there's PDF to render PDFs. It uses LaTeX or LaTeX, but I learned that in the publishing world. So I learned how to pronounce it like a nerd. Um, and technically I should have fixed how this is written because that, that A is supposed to be subscript and then the X is actually supposed to be a chi. Uh, but um, so this is the, uh, anyway, LaTeX is the um, like format and then rendering engine to create things like PDFs with uh, formatting. Uh, DocX is to render <clears throat> Microsoft Word documents. Um, and, you know, that has its own uh, issues, but also, you know, then they're generally shareable with a lot of people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, GFM is GitHub flavored markdown. So like all the, um, the readmes on GitHub, if you want it to render into that read, that dot md format 
uh, that you can use GFM for that. And then uh, IPI NB for Jupyter Notebooks. Um, they, you know, briefly mentioned this here, mentioned it at the end. I think it's their little way of, hey, we have to uh, mention that we are cross-platform now. So, or cross, whatever, cross, uh, hit cross platforms fine. So, you know, you can work with Jupyter or you can work with Julia, Python, and R now in uh, Quarto versus R Markdown. Technically, you can in incorporate uh, other languages, but you did so by wrapping them in R uh, versus in Quarto. You can do all these different things. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks are kind of just like an alternative to Quarto, really. Like they're a different way of mixing code and text. Um, and so you can take the Quarto and render into IPy and B, and then um, we might talk about a little bit that you can actually use those IPy and B files and put them into a Quarto site um, without having to convert them to Quarto. So it's they just want to play nice with everything is basically the idea here. Um, you can also do presentations in Quarto. Uh, you can use the um, you know single hash at the beginning of a line for a new section or double hash for a new slide. Um, new section is also a new slide, but it's a special kind of new slide. It does a different transition and it has slightly different rules of formatting. Uh, and then there are presentation formats for there's Reveal JS, which is the one that really you should use if you're using Quarto because it does um, like lots of things that are nice for uh, online presentations. I guess technically you might need to render to PowerPoint or to PDF. So the other two are there as well. You can do PPTX to go directly to PowerPoint and Beamer to go to PDF presentations that again use LaTeX, uh, this Beamer format, which is basically just you know a, a page per slide in the deck. Um, there is more information on their website. Um, and that's kind of the rule for this whole chapter, which might end up being a really short meeting. We'll see that everything is, here's a introduction, go read our website. And, you know, partly because the book was finishing kind of as Cordo was finishing. And so I don't think they wanted to put everything about Cordo into the book and then have it be false a month later. Uh, and so it's a lot of, go see what the website says, because that's what's true today. Um, all right, and we'll see some more of that too. Uh, interactivity. So when we're in HTML, uh, it's a web page, and so you can have interactive things. Um, they talk about two of those in the book, and I added the third one. Uh, that's kind of important these days. So there's HTML widgets for um, if you just want people in their browser to be able to play with things, but it doesn't actually interact with any server side processing. It can't use actual R code, it's all in JavaScript at that point. Um, and yes, uh, and uh, Gabby mentioned in the chat, WebR, which um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. So that should be in this list too. Um, Shiny is the um, you know, RStudio R package for interactivity uh, with server-side processing. That can also be uh, there's um, Pi Shiny, or I think that's how they, I can't remember if it's Pi Shiny or Shiny Pi. I think it's Pi Shiny that they call it generally, but it's the Python version of Shiny. Um, so with either of those, you can you can write things in Quarto documents and have them uh, both server side and, uh, or you know, client side, but interacting with something on the server side. And then there's Shiny Live. Uh, which isn't in the book, which lets you do shiny style interactivity, but no server. I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about the caveats around that. And then that is built on WebR, which is a way, a, a system to run web or to run R in the user's browser. And so then there's no server side involved. But again, there are caveats with that that are the same or related caveats to Shiny Live. All right, so we'll start with HTML widgets. So HTML widgets is a package, uh, but it's also like a bunch of other packages that use that package that um, it's basically just ways to wrap um, HTML and JavaScript and CSS up into R code. So you use R code to generate things that are really under the hood. It's generating 
HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And then you can put those together on web pages. Um, and so I list, or well, the previous cohort listed a bunch of these packages and I uh, kept them. Um, so some examples, are, there's Leaflet, which makes nice interactive maps. If you go into the book, he has, or well, they have, but I assume Headley had a strong uh, influence on this, that they have a um, map of New Zealand that is zoomed in somewhere that I assume is important to Headley or possibly to his sister, because I think she does a lot of the um, Quarto documentation and stuff. So uh, there's digraphs for time series visualizations, um, DT for tables, uh, also GT has interactive tables now. Um, but it, even before they were interactive, it had uh, HTML tables that it generates. Uh, 3JS um, is 3D plots, but you can also do all kinds of plotting stuff in there, interactive plots. Uh, diagrammer, um, I can't remember if that E is actually supposed to be there. It is, okay, <laughs> so that's not a typo. So. That's for like flowcharts, uh, node link diagrams, all kinds of like diagram style charts. And then htmlwidgets.org has a directory of, I think it's a hundred and something. Um, yeah, so 132 CRAN packages are available if you go to, uh, oh wait, okay, it's 132. 70 of which are on CRAN. Um, so yeah, it's a whole bunch of different packages. And you know, if we scan through here, you can see all kinds of different things. So um, lots of options there. And if you do know some HTML and or JavaScript, uh, you can use HTML widgets to wrap those up and include them in your R uh, output. Um, so the other option is Shiny. Uh, to, to use Shiny within Quarto, within a HTML format um, document, you just add the server Shiny. Uh, and then within code blocks, you know, you can have one code block where you uh, have the inputs. So this will generate like a text input and a numeric input. And then you have another code block where you just give it context server and put the server side code. If you've worked with Shiny, um, if I'm like prototyping something, I often find the old R Markdown way and now Quarto um, easier to kind of mock something up because you're doing it kind of all in place and you can you don't have to worry about the layout as much because the Quarto is handling the layout. Um, and so I really like this kind of thing for quickly generating something if you have somewhere to deploy it that um, can handle the server side code. Or, and again, I don't show this very much, but Shiny Live, um, there's a website for this for the Shiny Live uh, Quarto extension. It tells you all about how to do it. Um, I didn't include the caveat that the first time you load a Shiny Live application tends to be kind of slow because it's got to load all the packages that are involved. But this is you know, a document that doesn't have a server side process running anything, but it is um, using R code to generate this plot, actually Python code in this case. Um, and you can do, you know, all, all kinds of things. This one actually has like the editor. Um, it's using Python examples, so I'm not going to go into exactly how to edit it, but you can edit the code and then it'll work. And the reason that that is safe to do is all of the code is running on my computer. It's not like I'm going to break something on their end by uh, editing that code. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, whatever. It's got a bunch of examples that you can go into. Uh, under the hood, that is using, <clears throat> at least in part, uh, WebR, which again is this project for uh, R in the browser. That again, you know, I link to that. Um, because that's a it's a, a, its own big uh, universe. Um, this is super active development on both of these. Uh, PositConf at the time of this recording is in a little under a month, so I wouldn't be surprised to see 
more about these two things in the next few weeks. Um, they tend to have big releases around posit comp. So uh, they might be done for now, but I don't know. It's something to watch out for. Um, the So, you know, the advantage is you don't have to have a server that is running Chinese server that is dealing with all the server side stuff. Um, but a disadvantage is, and, you know, it depends on what kind of shiny code you tend to make, but you can't have it like um, uh, hit APIs or do, you know, communicate out from the site because uh, it is restricted to be in its little box where it talks. Now, technically, if you go into all the WebR documentation, you can talk to the WebR chunk through JavaScript. So I think it's technically possible to get the, like to have a mix of server-side Shiny and client-side Shiny, for example, in a quarter doc, quarter doc, but it's not something they have implemented yet. Um, and you know, because of that, because everything is running on the client side, that means the client has access to anything. So if you wanted to use an API key to load some data, you would be giving the user that API key. So, uh, you know, some, some drawbacks, but on the other hand, everything's running on the client side. And so this is like, if you're trying to prototype something, you don't need a server that can handle a thousand people. If, you're, if your thing gets a surprising amount of interest and all of a sudden people are hitting it, each one of them is running the shiny code themselves. So you don't have to have a server that can handle all those people coming. I mean, it has to be able to send the page out to them, but it doesn't have to do all the processing. Uh, for whatever they're interacting with, which is a big, uh, huge improvement, actually. All right. Um, so the thing that, I don't know, almost everything I've done with Quarto, I guess I've done some one-off slide decks and things like that, but a lot of the stuff I've done is uh, projects where you group QMDs into websites or books. Um, actually, I've done a little bit of Porto books, I guess. Um, the idea is you put the, you know, and I put confirm there because I meant to confirm that. It says that you put QMD files in a single directory, but I actually know that's not true because uh, I have subdirectories in the website that we use for the, um, the book club I'm going to show you. Uh, so you put them into, you know, inside of a directory, but you can have subdirectories inside of that directory. Um, and then you have a, you can have an index.qmd, that's like the homepage, the root. And then you have this quarto.yaml um, underscore tends to be for like configuration files. And so the underscore quarto.yaml tells the structure of how you want your project to work. So this is like the very simple or one of the simplest versions of that, where you have project type book, you'd also have type website. Um, there's more in Quarto.org at these two different sites, but the easiest way to show this is to show this. <laughs> and so this is, um, let me zoom in. Oops. Um, yeah, it might be a little large, but we'll see. Uh, so this is the, um, version of, uh, the slides for the web APIs with R book club. This is my book that I am writing. And so I also used it to experiment with Cordo as the sort or as the engine for the book clubs. And so um, I, yeah, I'm going to go a little bit smaller. We So we have project type website, you know, you give it a title and then so we give it a sidebar and actually it'll probably be helpful to do uh, to see what we're talking about. So we'll go back and forth. So here I gave it a sidebar that is like the list of all the slides. And there I just give it, um, sorry, that the list is down here. So uh, yeah, in the sidebar, okay. Um, and so it's got the index, sorry, uh, where are we? Uh, index.qmd and then club intro.qmd. I did some fancy stuff where it uses this target so that when, um, like if I load that and then in theory, yeah, it doesn't load it into a new new window. It always loads it into the same new window. So if you already have it open. Anyway, so that's what that target thing is doing. Um, 
and then I have the intro of the book and then you know I have these sections so getting started get more data do more uh, with APIs and those are split up and again I have all the files and then target have the um, subdirectory for slides uh, separated out all that um let's see it you know we have these tools that's these things up here of um what do i want to show and what do i want it to do so it's the github icon links to the github for it youtube links to the playlist for the book club um and this i have it linking to me personally for this example because this is my book that i want to be involved with any questions people have uh but eventually we'll have it you know going to the dslc stuff um so there's all these, you know, you do all these settings and then you have the overall, you know, just separate QMD files. Um, let me see. There's, uh, there's also some um, theming stuff, but we won't go into that too, deep, too deeply. And then I actually have um, this slides directory it has its own little YAML that is um, a special thing where you can have it within this directory all of these have this format. So this says, oh, format is HTML, but this like overrides that and says the formats reveal JS and here's the settings for the reveal JS. Um, and I have some, you know, settings for that. And actually I feel like that should be in, if indent or indented, but I guess it works for um, the other formats because it didn't break. Um, and so, uh, you know, if we look at that, you know, we can see that this is all like normal HTML style. But when we open a specific uh, slide deck, it is slide style. It's um, got, you know, table of contents over here. Uh, and I don't know if this will show. Let me see. Um, no, I didn't share that, but it also has speaker notes that can open up. So I hit S and it opens the speaker notes, uh, which is a very nice thing that we will get uh, when we switch over to this format because it lets you put all those notes. If you look at our current slide decks, there are lots of things in them that are the kind of thing you want to like be able to say when you're presenting or, or maybe you want to keep a note for yourself and hey, we should talk about this. But it's not like what you want showing on screen necessarily. It's it doesn't have the key points and all that. So I really like that it, we can do that in the slide format. Um, this has some of the fancy like this is a um, section versus this is a uh, slide within that section. And you can see that it slides down when it's within the same section, and then we slide to the right when we go to a new section. Um, it's just some neat things that you can get with uh, these Quarto slide decks. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, a project. I guess technically I could. Um, I think I have this set up as Quarto book. Um, so it's going to take a second to switch. And so, yeah. So this one is uh, a Cordo book. Um, same kind of idea, but instead of the, you know, website style things, we have um, more standard book things. And if we just go to there that's what this is um so you know ends up it looks very similar but i wanted to be able to do some slightly different things with the the clubs and so that's why they use the website version instead of the book version um that you get that right you get this table of contents layout over here the way i have this set up um and it's got you know, different settings different places or different whatever a different look it does have the automatic numbering, and I actually didn't want that over on the website one because uh, we tend to have things that aren't exactly the chapters, and so the automatic numbering breaks things, but we do have that over here. Um, and so that's uh, that's the two formats.
the two the two project formats. Um, Does it also uh, use alphabetic ordering if you do not specify the specific files that should be rendered? Yes. As in book down. Right. I'm trying to remember, actually. I haven't. Um, I, I actually don't. I don't know that it does. I think you have to tell it which ones to include in the Quarto format. Um, but I can't remember for sure because I've only used it for this one, basically. Okay, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and that is definitely a disadvantage, um, mostly. <laughs> but then the advantage is, it, I don't know, it makes you kind of uh, pay attention to that and it makes the file file names less vital to get exactly right um so yeah. uh yeah <laughs> i found it interesting in in book that i i always started with a number yep and jumping with uh, an interval of 10 for example and then you have some flexibility <laughs> yeah yeah we have lots of examples of wait dealing with that in uh, various book clubs and so at, at first i was kind of annoyed that it wasn't going to do the automatic uh, set up in that way. And I was like, you know, I, I set up a book club once. So I don't care that much if it now takes me very slightly longer to set up because I have to create or put these files into an index. I'll just write a function that does that anyway. And then uh, it's just once and then it's all set up. And if we do like, you know, we've had um, clubs that add uh, like there was um, a what was it? it was it ISLR book club maybe and they added a discussion about like machine learning ethics that wasn't something in the book but it was you know something that we wanted to keep and like have in our uh, index of slides and it's like where does that go eh, with Quarto you just kind of put it where you want it and so um I think that'll be nice but yeah I I actually have been playing with do I want these numbered or not? Basically, on the um, this version, I think it is helpful to, for them to be numbered. But then again, is it? It, it like didn't look very nice. But it was the main thing. Um, but that is, you know, if you've ever made slides for our book clubs, uh, currently we fight against the numbering. I just had to go through and get rid of all the numbers in here because in the sections, probably since we have just done this book. Um, it does, but you know, you get something in the table of contents for every slide, which isn't really what we want. You know, it, it just makes things look weird and come out weird. Versus now, here we have a table of contents for the deck, which is separate from the table of contents for the book, and I think that makes a lot more sense. Um, and then you know, we also you can see these sections versus individual slides comes out really nice in table of contents. So, uh, that'll be much nicer. Um, but I am glad to have the table of contents because I need to jump to there. All right. <laughs> um, I don't think they have other uh, multi-page formats. Um, you know, that's another reason to link to the uh, manuscripts that might be kind of count. Um, yeah, but they don't have a uh, separate, you know, website level. I guess dashboard is kind of a uh, uh, equivalent, and that's new since the book came out. And so that's an, another reason that linking to the help is very important. So, yeah, they also have. Uh, dashboards, which are kind of like um, multi-page uh, apps, you know, like a shiny app. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be multi-page, but I can't remember. Uh, it's a format dashboard. I guess that's a single page, but it's, anyway. Um, and I think we only have, um, oh, yeah, we have two you slides can here. In those dashboards, you can have tabs. So I don't know if that counts as a multi-page. Yeah. So you can have, 
it's like a hybrid over there, right? Like a shiny thing. But I think it's than... more. It's like equivalent to presentation slides. I think that the the thing that would be treated as a slide is treated as a tab. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what they're. So it's still it's more more equivalent to presentations than it is to websites. Um, Maybe um, I can jump in here. Oh. Um, sorry. Hi, everybody. Go ahead. Hi. Um, but uh, actually, just last night, I um, was in the Our Ladies Rome um, no. meeting, and they had a presentation on Porto <laughs> dashboards. So, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it's it's more like a static website, basically. Um, and yeah, um, it'll just be one page. Um, okay. And then it's it's put together with cards like you would do in a shiny dashboard. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah they should. They need more. Um, they have additional articles, but they really need. You know, I guess they haven't had long enough, but they need a gallery. They have a gallery, but not of, uh, well, <laughs> they do have a gallery of dashboards. I was wrong. Um, and so, like, Gapminder is one that is done a lot in examples. And you can see, um, yeah, so you can get the mouse over effects. And we can see that we have tabs up here, one, one for the indicators and then one for the actual full table of data. So that's kind of cool. Um, but cool, thank you. I, I haven't played with dashboards. I'm trying to think, I think I might have made one just to see how it's done, but I haven't really dug into them. Um, the book mentions uh, Quartal journal, journal templates and we have a link over to that uh, for different um, article templates. Um, and also mentions IPI and B again here, but I took the link out because we had that. But in general, you know, quoto.org, that's where it had, they have all the stuff, including the gallery. So you can go see other examples. Um, and they do also have their own uh, like reference for different things to look at to um, like find your way around um, and to do fancier things. Um, but we also have some resources that we link to. There's Quarto.pub. That's a platform for publishing Quarto. There's also now uh, Posit Connect Cloud, Posit Cloud Connect, whatever they are, Connect Cloud, I think, um, which is kind of like Quarto.pub and uh, shinyapps.io and some Python stuff mixed together. Um, I, I was very sad that it does not yet have Plumber. And that's the thing that is available in Connect that isn't available to publish anywhere free yet. Um, and so I'm watching that to see if they come out with a free tier that also lets you publish to Plumber because it's hard to learn Plumber right now because you need to set up a server to deploy it on. Um, and that's you know not necessarily... Like if you know how to do that, you might not need plumber anymore. Um, anyway, so there's quarto.pub. We also have this awesome quarto website um, at, at github.com slash mcnuil slash awesome quarto. Um, it has just links to all kinds of quarto things. Uh, it's like the collection of all the quarto links. So they have talks about quarto. They have um, blogs about quarto. They have uh, all kinds of different tutorials that people have written. Um, and so lots and lots of things. If you want to go learn you know, everything you want, want to learn about Quarto, you can find there. Um, Quarto.org that we've seen over and over, but it's good to have a link to it again. And then there's uh, the Quarto Dev uh, GitHub repo, uh, actually GitHub org. And then there are different um, aspects of Quarto within that. So anything that you want to dig deep into, you can come here and, you know, let's see how the Quarto R package is progressing and you can, you know, follow pull requests or issues. Um, little surprised they don't have discussion forum on there, but um, 
Yeah. And so you can go, you know, find out more info about all the different quarto options. Um, yeah, so that's chapter 29. It's the end of the book. Very exciting. Um, yeah, I was, I was like, we're not cheating. They don't have um, the our packages book has like an extra chapter after the last chapter. It has an appendix with some add on things. And it's like, oh, so are we done or are we not done? But no, we're done. This is the end of the book. Uh, and like we talked about a little bit at the beginning, this is a long book. It is very satisfying uh, to make it to the end. Oh, and I guess for another example of a quarto book, um, you can see there's a little tag at the bottom of all the R4DS pages that are that it's it is a quarto book. Um, and so you can actually go into the GitHub repo of R4DS itself. And it is an example of its last chapter. <laughs> and so you can see kind of how it all gets put together. And, you know, some more advanced features because obviously, like, they know how to use Quarto pretty well. Um, and so I can't remember if they have anything particularly crazy that they do in here. But I think if you go into the chapters, you'll see that there is some code that is, like, auto-loaded from other parts of the book and different things like that. Um, so you can see how uh, cross-linking works and all that stuff. Um yeah, another aspect that I didn't really show, but Quarto in our studio, there's a visual editor for Quarto. So uh, I think that also that there's a visual editor for our markdown as well, but I've been using nothing but Quarto lately. So um, yeah, so yeah, that's the book. <laughs> oh, I, the thing I didn't, so actually I didn't prepare this, but a thing I like to do in the last one is, you know, mention that, hey, you've done a book club now. And if there's any other book you want to read, uh, we have lots of clubs. And the one thing that stops clubs, the main thing that stops clubs from launching is they need somebody to volunteer to like be in charge. Um, yeah. And so, you know, like, you know that Gabby, cause you're running one yeah. now, but uh, you don't, you're not a facilitator yet. Are you Flores? Is... Yes, I am. Oh, you are, you are, right. You are. <laughs> so yeah, darn, I can't Which recruit book? anyone here. <laughs> It uh, is uh, called Spatial Statistics for Data Science in R or something. I, I always mix space up. Stats. <laughs> space stats. Space yes. stats. Mm, it makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Spatial yeah. Statistics for Data Science yeah. Theory and Practice with R. Yeah. Um, that's right. So, yeah, normally I would like try to recruit uh, right now. Of uh, We need always need more people, but you're doing what you need to do. Uh, there are lots of options. You know, if you are watching this and have just read uh, R4DS, you now have the baseline to do, like, lots of things can be the next book, you know, because <laughs> um, it takes you through all the, I mean, I was going to say the basics, but it's way more than just the basics. Um, yeah, so there's so much in it. Um First edition had a modeling chapter. They don't have that anymore because they recommend that you go to tidy modeling with R next. Um, and so that is uh, one option. Um, I go back and forth about whether I would recommend this or there's um, uh, ISL. ISLR is what it's known as. And then I can't remember what it actually stands for. Uh, which is the introduction to statistical learning using R. Um, this book, Introduction to Statistical Learning, has both a R version and a Python version. Uh, we have relatively frequent book clubs for really for both of them. Um, it's a good baseline of just like what is machine learning, what models are there, um, what are kind of the different things that you're doing in different types of models versus, um, I got rid of the tab, but tidy modeling with R is less about um, how should you model? And it's like, how do you write the code to model? And so um, I'd probably recommend ISLR, I don't know. But it, so if you have tidy modeling under or with R under your belt and then you read ISLR, the code is easier because you don't have to do it the way they say. You can do, oh, I know how to do that. I know how to use tidy modeling with R. 
But if you have ISLR already under your belt, when you read Tidy Modeling with R, you can understand what they're doing in all the different models where they kind of gloss that over because they, uh, you know, they aren't explaining how the model works. They're explaining how to implement it in R. Um, both of those are really good if you're doing modeling. Uh, R packages is one of my favorites. Uh, if you want to write in R package, uh, advanced R is always a good one to go on to next. We have a cohort cohort that's, I think, about halfway through the book uh, running right now. And we could always start another one. Um, and so, yeah, any, you know, like I said, the two of you have already uh, bought in. You're already doing the, the right thing and running your own cohort because that's how you can get any book running. You know, any, any book that is available free online, if you, if you have presented at least once, then you can run a cohort. And as long as you can find four other people to agree on a time, then we will launch a club. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that's that's the book. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, John. This was, I think I should have started with this one. If anyone was were to ask me, I'm new to R, what books mm -hmm. you recommend, what workflow, etc. Based on my experience, I would say start with this one. This is like a non-negotiable. <laughs> you have to start with this one. And then if you're really serious about R, coding, etc., go to Advanced R, read that one, <laughs> and the ggplot book so that you know how to yeah. create graphs. I would say that those are the the three, like the foundations. Um, yeah. You wanna get, depends on how serious you are, right, with your code. I, and then I and all of that. Recommend, yeah, I always recommend this one first. There is um, there's uh, Garrett Grohlmund, who is co-author um he co-authored the first edition of r for ds uh and then also the second edition um why do i oh this is the uh this is our books our, our notes i was like why are there extra things here um but he has a book that i cannot remember the name of it's like introduction to r or beginning r or introduction to programming with R. I don't remember. It, it is technically a lower level book than R for DS. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read that one, uh, but I have heard that it's an even gentler introduction. But I really like how R for DS um, just dives in. Like mm -hmm. in that first chapter, you actually do things. Like you, you have output of plots and you can you know you start to explore data versus a lot of things take a long time to get anywhere to where you're actually able to do anything yeah because i remember that the other books i mean the way i started right like those books were so boring because it starts <laughs> like with a lot of chapters on like like a dance art subsetting or just lists. yeah and you're like yeah. i don't want to see boring lists you know what i mean like i don't want to subset say, that's so boring but this book, that's one of the things that I like. It's very engaging yeah. right very from the very start. And then um, it gives you a little bit of everything so that you can then see, oh, yeah, I don't really remember or understand a lot about how to do graphs. So that, that's the thing that I need to work on more. But maybe functions, right. yeah, that was enough for me or something. I don't know. I feel like it, it, it does a very good job at going through everything, including base R and tidy, uh, tidy code. So, yeah. so yeah, you have everything here. Yeah. I love so, it. So, uh, yeah, there was this blog post uh, quite a long time ago. He says a few years ago within uh, the blog, but then this blog itself is like eight years old or something. Um, mm. But it was like controversial of teaching teaching the tidyverse first and i'm like no seriously r for ds that start there um like uh it's probably in here somewhere that he talks about that you know other programming languages famously the first thing you write is a function called hello world that will say hello to the user you know it's print hello world or whatever it's not i guess you don't even write a function but whatever you learn how to make it uh make that language print hello world 
and it's like famous. That's what you do first in every programming language. And he says, our hello world is like a ggplot. Like that's the first thing you do. And then you learn other things, but you know, you could start with, here's a, here's how to make a plot of dots that spell out the words, hello world. And you know, that would be just as easy as a starting point. And so um, he talks a lot about that in here of like, just get yeah, started. Get Show, like, yeah. Because yeah. then you're like, oh, I can do a thing. And then, oh, I can see how these commands are just slightly changing that thing or maybe majorly changing that thing. And so, um, yeah. and yeah, no, see my, my students are beginners. So that's why I don't, I don't know. I've never bothered with that other book that is aimed at beginners because I'm like, yes, so is r for ds It doesn't assume you know anything other than maybe like what a plot is. Um, but even then, not really. <laughs> So, but even then, not really. No, yeah. I think um, because, for example, I am I'm advanced. I'm not as advanced as you, but I am. I consider myself a little bit advanced coder, and I learned a lot from this book, like a lot, because the way that they explain things, it's super. Uh, I don't want to say simple in a bad way, but it's very simple in the sense that, for example, now every time I write a function. I remember that in the book, for example, it said, if you are copying, you, you have to be, be aware, right? Like if you are copying the same thing over and over again, what you need to do is not just notice that you're copying the same thing over and over again, but also notice the thing that stays the same and the thing that varies. The thing that varies is the argument that goes into your function, if the thing that you're going to ask. And I'm like, that's, that's the thing that plays in my mind every time I want to write a function. <laughs> Yep. So they, because they explained it very simple, right? Like very easily. And students are like that. You don't want to overwhelm them with um, a lot of words and, I don't know, information. So it does a good job at that too. That's why I like it. Yeah. Huh. So, yeah, I haven't gone into this. It's interesting because this was published in 2014. So um, I don't know how... A lot this has book changed. Is anymore. Yeah. But I don't know how much yeah. has changed in the online version versus the uh, published version. So, um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, so that book is linked in uh, R for DS. I, I had forgotten about that. Um, and mm. I was just curious because, you know, they talk about the uh, prerequisites, but it's like, yeah, you need to be able to install R. Here's how to install R. So it's not really a prerequisite yes. at that point. <laughs> you need to be able to read. And that's yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm a, a definitely a big fan of this book. That's why our <laughs> group was originally yeah, yeah. named after it. <laughs> and, um, mm, and yeah, the whole our our uh, community began as a book club to read R for DS. So. Um, this you know, I do. I think so. Thing. This started in. It has to have. It had to have been twenty eighteen, maybe. I think it was twenty seventeen. Probably twenty seventeen. Yeah. So I don't know how I found it. I always wanted to tell you the story, and I'm sorry I'm <laughs> using some of the time from the book club. But yep. I remember seeing it on Twitter because I'm addicted to Twitter. Not so <laughs> much anymore, but back then I was full on in my addiction. So I was like eating all the content because I was just starting my PhD. So I was just eating everything that <laughs> anyone was saying about R because I wanted to be better and get better at that. And somehow I found either your account or the um, R4DS, uh, the community or something. And I remember that, that book club. I remember the first day. And I think it was, it probably, it was probably this book if that's what you say. Mm. But I remember feeling... I am, because it was like a lot of the big names were in that, uh, I don't know if it was Zoom or if it was like a Skype or whatever. I don't remember what it was. A lot of the big names were there. And I remember that there were in the chat, a lot of like inside jokes. And I was like, is this the right place for me to be? Maybe huh. not. I don't remember. I... So then I, go ahead. I don't Sorry. remember. I, I, I wasn't there at the beginning because it was. Uh... No. Uh, Jesse Mustapak started it, and I didn't see it until uh, three months later or something. So um, I never actually participated in that original. They had 
uh, two iterations of book clubs, uh, staggered start, and I didn't do anything with the book clubs. I just was, I joined I the I need Slack. to find those emails <laughs> because I remember it. And I was like, I can't with the with the chat and then try to pay attention to the slides. I can't do that. Right. Um, but I stayed on the, I don't know if it, it had Slack. I think it, it did have a Slack at yep. the beginning. But I stayed yep. there asking my questions and everybody was super <laughs> nice about it. And that's exactly. how, so I've been here since the beginning, John. Awesome. Since the beginning. I'm like a founding <laughs> member here, you know, just kidding. But, um, but yeah, I, I've been here since the beginning and I am super happy with this community. And now that I got a book club that you teach, and that's, I feel like <laughs> I just graduated. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you've done all, right, yeah. all kinds of them now. So, um, yeah, I am very happy to have gotten through this book again. It's a good book. Um, and I'll, it'll, you know, I'm going to take a little bit of time not doing it, but I'll probably run another cohort through because I learn something new each time and make the whole site a little bit better each time. And so, um, yeah. Very cool. And I will go ahead and end the video.